Okay, so, so Carla, I read your book, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to go to the first play here. Um, actually, no, you know what? You, you start. You just... I'm not sure where to start, to be honest. Okay. Um, so if you want to... Yeah, I do that. When, once I get started, I won't shut up, but okay. I'm just not sure where to start. No, that's fair enough. So um, I read your book, Bearing Witness, and it's, it's heartbreaking. I'm a mom uh, of three. My oldest just turned 13. And um, I won't say that I know what you've been through because um, I don't. I have a hard enough time um, looking at pictures of my own accident and seeing them through the eyes of my mother. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I, I don't see me in the hospital, but I see a little girl, and I just can't imagine how my mom did it. It's imagine. It's it's amazing how when you become a parent, you start viewing those things differently. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, you'll do anything for your children. And um, my kids stub their toe and it breaks my heart, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so you, though, have this quote on your computer. It says, your love never failed and that will always be enough. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, did you um, come across that quote? Did you come up with it? No, I found it somewhere and I don't know where it was. Um, I'm on a lot of groups okay. on Facebook and stuff and I, and I came across that because... One of the things with suicide is that the pe suicide survivors, um, which is what I am, it, you're left with so many unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest questions for me, and, and, and it's a reoccurring theme that I've heard from other parents as well, is how could they do this knowing the emotions that would be left and, yeah. and how much it would hurt the people who love them. And I was listening to a TED talk by the mother of the Columbine shooter. Mm -hmm. And in it, she said that she had been talking to her coworker and she had said to her coworker, he must not have, my son must not have loved me as much as I thought, or he wouldn't have done this because it was basically murder, suicide, the Columbine shootings. And somebody else, over, this other woman overheard them talking, and she took her to a side afterwards, and she said, I want to tell you something. She said, when my three kids were really, really tiny, I went into a severe depression. And I love those kids as much as any mother does, passionately. Mm -hmm. But when you are that depressed, your mind is sick, mm -hmm. and you are in a place where you convince yourself, or you're convinced that the people in your life would be better off without you. And she said, I'm here to tell you, your son loved you. Wow. And what this mother also, so then the mother went on to say, if love was enough, there wouldn't be near as many suicides as there are. And that is something that has brought me a lot of comfort. Well, yeah, I, um, I agree with that completely. Yeah. And mental illness, there's so many different types but um, as we all know, there's such a stigma around it. Well, why don't you just think happy thoughts? <laughs> why don't you just smile all the time? You know, there, it's, yeah. it's awful. And um, when you were saying that, it popped in my head that, you know, mental illness, it's exactly that. Our brain, um, I, I suffer from mental illness, depression and anxiety. Um, but our brain doesn't work how it should. Mm -hmm. You know, just like if you have um, uh, the flu, you know, it's such well, a simple illness. Your stomach isn't working yeah. as it should. The know? same mother, she said, I, I don't really like saying mental illness. She says, I like to say brain health. Oh, how come? Because it's about the health of your brain, just like okay. it's the health of your stomach or whatever. Okay. Okay. Hey. Rather than it being brain mental, health. it's brain health. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's another way to re reformat the question yeah. or the story, change the story a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. So your son, um, he suffered from depression uh, and addictions as well. Yeah. What, well, what happened, um, I first became aware uh, that he was uh, using um, pot in particular when he was 16. And um, it got progressively worse. But it was, it was strange because he wasn't a partier. It wasn't like he was out with his friends doing this and stuff. And it got progressively worse, and then drinking became an issue, and I know there were other drugs involved. And I always thought, well, if we could just get him clean, then he could go on to be the person he's supposed to be, that mm -hmm. I know he is, I know he's a good person. 25, um, he took stress relief from work. 
And when he went to go, his time was up. He went to go back and he wanted to take another set of stress sleeve. And they said, well, you can, but we want you to go into rehab as a condition. And he agreed to that. And taking him there was the hardest thing I've ever done. He was just shaking. He was so scared. But when he was there, and I found this out months after he uh, was finished with the rehab, but he came out really positive. He had received a diagnosis in there that he had what is called avoidant personality disorder. Okay. And it's, you know, he, I, I'd never heard of it before, so I went and I looked it up. And it is exactly, like it just fit him to a T. Um, when he was younger, people would ask him, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he'd say a hermit. Hmm. He just wanted to be by himself. He thought he gave serious thought as an adult of being a forest ranger because then he could go up into the by himself. Yeah. Um, but when you look at avoidant personality disorder, they um, they're convinced they're not as attractive. They're convinced they're not as smart. They're convinced that everyone's out to get them. People are laughing at them, and it made so much sense because he would tell me, you know, he'd start a, a job and he'd be doing great at it, and then he'd start saying they don't like me. I'm like, what are you talking about? They don't like you. What's not to like? You're a great person. No, no, they're they're trying to get me fired, and they're and I'm like, what? A, like, all of a sudden, everything made sense, and and I became started to become very aware of the fact that the drugs and the alcohol were not the problem. Yeah, they were a symptom. Yeah, and he was self medicating in order to in order to deal with his internal pain, because he, I mean, he was by himself all the time. He was really with, you know, he had friends, but. He wasn't a partier. He didn't go out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, people would... Um, he, he would get invited to a family function. And he'd say, yeah, okay, I'm going to go. And then at the last minute, no, I'm, I, I'm not going. I'm not going. And we couldn't figure out why. What, 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 it's family. Yeah. But he thought that people were laughing at him. He thought that he would be ridiculed, that they were snickering behind his back, that... And, you know, when somebody said, well, is it just like being really shy? And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it goes way deeper than that. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So that is what the pain that he was dealing with through his life. That's heartbreaking. It is. Yeah. So you talk about the good times. First of all, I like, you're, you're talking about uh, a few things that you've learned so far your, and your gratitude. Uh, I like that you said casseroles are appreciated. <laughs> and wine. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and <first>. wine. <laughs> um, but you say, talk about the good times. They don't make the pain worse. That isn't possible. But it is, it is like a balm on the wound. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was, um, you know, my grandma, when she passed away, she didn't want a funeral. She just wanted a celebration of life. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we did. We talked about the, the good times. And... Um, you know, I thought it would be easier, but I, I still spent the whole funeral crying or yeah. celebration of life crying just because you miss them so much. Yeah. Um, but now, almost, well, two and a half years later, it, it still helps you? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's weird because <laughs> I enjoyed his funeral, which sounds really bizarre. And it's not that it wasn't excruciatingly painful. But it comforted me because um, I had put the word out with one of his friends and I said, if anybody has any stories, I really want to hear them. So there were about five people that came up during his memorial and spoke about, you know, well, when we went to um, a trip overseas with him right after high school, I remember the time this and I remember the time that. And it just, I got to see him from a different set of, mm -hmm. a different outlook because the last, it had been very dark time. Mm -hmm. um, everything related to him was very dark up until that point and to see him through the eyes of his friends was really important to me and the other way I explain it to people is if you share with me a memory of my son my son will never make more memories mm -hmm. and so what you're giving me is a treasure you're giving me a gift of a memory of him that I didn't have before so and those are not, there's no new ones. Yeah. It's like lamb, they don't make it anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know, so um, it's a gift. And it helps keep his memory alive. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I've never really quite figured out what that expression means, but. You, now that you say that, I don't even know if I know what it means. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, I wonder if um, it maybe stems from don't forget about them, but yeah. you never would. No, you know. No. Uh, so it, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it just it, it gives me pleasure to hear, you know, especially positive stories of when he was happier. Yeah, and to know that he had the friends and that he had people around him who cared about him. That was that was really comforted me a lot. I, yeah, I bet. Okay, so yeah. this hit me hard. <laughs> um, what is it? I would have flagged it a million times if I could. So you say I've been trying to think of a nonprofit <laughs> or foundation that would really fit and honor my son Adam. The closest <laughs> I've come is raising money to send poor kids to see Metallica. I have to tell you. Did you laugh out loud? I I didn't because I just I was like, oh my gosh, like yes, do it. Uh, it was a joke. Oh, but seriously. But 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 I was trying to think of the most ridiculous thing because. You know, you, it, it's always about, you know, poor little starving kids. But the, the the image I was trying to get across was like, how ridiculous would that be? You know, you got that little big fat tummy and you're starving to death and you're in Africa and whatever. Yeah. And we're going to send you tickets to Metallica, yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. yeah, because, yeah. because he was such a Metallica fan. I mean, when he went overseas, they followed Metallica and went and saw them three or four times oh, or cool. something. And like he, Metallica, you know how hard it was doing his memorial though. Picking out metallic songs, yeah, yeah, appropriate for a few. Yeah, I ended. Yeah. I have found a couple that were actually instrumental. Which ones did you pick? I can't remember the names, okay. but they were instrumentals. Okay, and so you, if you knew, if you knew, because I didn't know any Metallica songs. Yeah, anyway. it's not my genre of music, and um, so yeah, when I. So. so I guess when you said poor kids, I didn't think, like, no, Ethiopian. Like, yeah. Oh, and, and I realized after I posted, because people started saying, oh, there's 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 an organization that does that. They send kids to, you know, the... And I'm like, well, that's not really what I meant. But <laughs> um, what it meant to me, as uh, I've struggled with addic or addiction, sorry, uh, depression, mm -hmm. since I was a teenager. Uh, and... Music saved my life in many ways. Uh, any Nirvana mainly, um, but concerts to this day, and I imagine for the rest of my life, are uh, my best friend and I call them our therapy sessions. <laughs> and if we are, no matter how what's going on in my life and how depressed I am, or uh, sad about anything, when I'm at a concert of any kind. It just, I feel at home. Isn't that neat how that kind of, like, it hits people different ways? Yeah. So when I read that, I was like, absolutely. You should do it. Maybe not poor <laughs> kids, but, like... Starting you know, kids from third world nations. <laughs> you could do that, too. I think female would be a better idea. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> send a can of pizza. But even, like, um, can of kids with, um, or anybody, yeah. like, I don't know if... Like, obviously, because of confidentiality. Yeah. But you're um, heavily involved with CASA. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know when Metallica's coming back or if they're coming back. But, you know, it wouldn't be a bad... Uh, um, I'll keep that in mind. ...little fundraiser. <laughs> like I said, for, for me personally, yeah. like, concerts are just like a therapy session. Yeah. For me. yeah. Well, and Adam, I mean, he loved, you know, Metallica and Red Hot Chili Peppers was another big yeah. one of his. He liked, so. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Personally, yeah. I love it. Oh, yeah, I was just going to look that up. Um, sorry, I hope you don't mind. I'm just... Oh, that's okay. This, I you made me think when you talk about uh, the expression committed suicide. I never <sighs> thought of it the way you explain it, like committed a crime. And I didn't... I know that committing suicide was considered illegal before, which I always found was absolutely ridiculous. Because um, if you legislate something, it'll just stop people. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I do remember hearing, like, so then if somebody attempts to commit suicide and they don't, then they can be charged. And I'm like, well, that let's help them. Yeah. Instead of throwing them in jail. Yeah. Like, you're yeah. kidding me? Yeah. Um, but no, your whole post, like, it really, well, it really made me think. Well, and, and there's... Um, I'm a bit of an anomaly mm -hmm. within the world um, of suicide survivors because I know there's a lot of people who feel very strongly and and are very offended by the expression committed suicide. I personally don't take great offense to it. Yeah. It it's I don't 
which is weird because I'm a communicator and I'm a writer and words are a big thing. I have a daughter who has Down syndrome and if somebody say, she says she's a Downs kid, I would smack them. You know, like words matter. Yeah. But for some reason that one doesn't. And I don't know if it's because it's just, I feel like there's so many other hills to die on. And because I don't have that connotation with it, I know why people are offended because it used to be illegal and they're trying to destigmatize it. But I don't think that the destigmatizing part of that is that it used to be illegal. Yeah, and you say that mental illness yeah. is the stigma, not whether my child committed a crime. Yeah. And uh, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And so that's that's my perspective on it. When I do write about it or talk, I I do try to 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 not use that expression, not because it offends me, but because I know it's a stumbling block for other people. That mm -hmm. it would sh make other people. There are some other people that would be listening to me that would shut down yeah. and not be able to hear my, what I'm saying because they would stumble over that. So I just try and be sensitive to that. Yeah, but I certainly don't get upset at people. It. Uh I never thought about it in that sense, though, until I read yeah. that. So, um, yeah, yeah, and if you if you go online and you you can Google how to cover how to report on suicides and stuff, and they'll they'll tell you all the different like you, the proper phrases to use. Like if you read the newspaper, you'll notice they don't use that expression "committed suicide." Yeah, I don't think I did notice that I wasn't looking for it. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. And until you're for whatever reason. Uh, faced with that, you don't notice that. But yeah, yeah. it's been a change. Yeah. Um, this poem, um, I, I found it also very emotional when you talk to me about the death of my child. Um, I, I always have a hard time when anybody loses anybody. You don't, you don't know what to say. Uh, close family friends of ours just lost their father right before Christmas, and uh, we grew up with them, so they're like cousins, closer yeah. than cousins. And as I was uh, writing out the, the card for the funeral for the family, all my sisters were like, what do, you, what do we say? You know, and yeah. it's, I think everybody thinks that. So, um, you know, just say your story. Say you remember my child if you do. Yeah. Let me talk about my child. Mention my child's name and just let me cry. Yeah. I think that that's... Um, yeah, yeah, because I think that was one of the things that I've learned through all of this. Is you know, people say, "I just don't know what to say." Well, that's because there's nothing to say. Yeah, you can't say. I mean, what are you going to say? Are you, are you trying to make the person feel better? Because you can't. Yeah, yeah there's nothing. You <laughs> can there's say nothing you can say better. that's going to yeah. make them feel better. So, you know, I think there's there's been a few things that you know. Um, I I don't think anybody's ever said anything that I found offensive. Um, there's a couple things I, I have found more comforting than others. Um, and I, I think I put that one in the book. Um, there was a woman on Facebook who said, Carlo, I didn't know him, but one thing I know is that your son deserves your suffering. What did she mean by that? No, it wasn't deserved. Your son was worth the suffering. Okay. Yeah, that didn't sound right. And that was like, it was permission. Um, and and I've, I've struggled a lot in the last year or so with impatience with myself. I should be better. I should be further down this grieving journey, et cetera, et cetera. And I've done a lot of soul searching about it. And I realized that when I think about what it would mean if I got over it and I feel this incredible sadness and I realize that it's not that I enjoy grieving by any stretch of imagination I'd love it if this would just go away but how do I just forget how do I just not let this affect me my son was worth way more than that and I don't want, I don't know, I want, uh, what's popping to me, I don't want to lose him, I don't want to lose the memory, I, 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 I can't express it exactly, except that it just fills me with sadness to think about being over it. Yeah. 
but that's not to say I'm wallowing in it. So it's it's weird. <laughs> yeah, no, but I get it. I think. Yeah. Um, trying to put myself in your shoes. Um, if if I'm understanding it correctly, to get over it, there's there's a fear that you may forget him. Yeah. There's a video out there, if you get a chance, Billy Bob Thornton, of all people. Um, if you Google his video of him talking about his brother, okay, he lost his brother. His brother was two years older or two years younger than him. And he talks about, you have to get used to the idea that you're never going to be the same again. He said, there is a melancholy about me that will never go away. Yeah. I am equal parts happy and equal parts sad at any given time. And I just thought, oh my god, he gets it. Yeah. If you get a chance, I would highly I recommend it. And it's about three yeah. minutes long. Yeah. But I just thought, I want to sit down and talk to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not a big Billy Bob Thornton fan, but yeah. yeah. That's it. it he, he gets it. Yeah. So much. And, and I thought, that's it. There's a melancholy about me that I don't think will ever go away. There's a sadness to me that I don't think it's changed me. Absolutely, because before you were a uh, mother, you're still a mother, but now you're a mother who lost a child. Yeah. And um, there, there's nothing like that. No going yeah. back. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I'm not comparing the death of a child, of your child, to my accident by any means, but my dad used to say, we have to find a new normal. Absolutely. You know, the, yeah. the little girl walked into that cabin and isn't here anymore. Yeah. Uh, so now we need to learn how to live life uh, with a burn survivor and as a burn survivor. And uh, uh, he, was, he was dead on. Like that was, was, I Sometimes I refer to uh, myself as dying in that explosion and a different me came out of it. Yeah. So yeah, finding a new normal. Um, because yeah, it 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 is life changing. Absolutely, it's life changing. Yeah. Like your son's not here, and um, so the heartache is always going to be there. Like I don't know how it couldn't be. Like you're his mother. Um, I'm so sorry. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I I hate the thought that people are worried about saying the wrong thing because, you know, and, and sometimes when I'm around people, especially if they knew Adam, and I can, like, say there's somebody that I haven't seen for a while, or maybe I haven't seen since Adam passed away, or whatever, like, I make a point of mentioning them. Oh, I remember when Adam used to do whatever, just to as a sort of an open door to invite them. It's okay. Yeah. And you can talk about the elephant that's in the room. I'm not going to disintegrate into a million pieces and blow away. Yeah. You and know? I think the reasons uh, people are unsure is because everybody grieves differently. Mm -hmm. So somebody else yeah. may, may very not well. want to talk yeah. about their child that, that they lost. Or, exactly. You know, so it is... Um, you know, in a sense, like walking on angels, like we want to be there, we want to be supportive, yeah. we just don't know how. Yeah. You know, so that's good for you to, you know, yeah. you know, kind of like throw that hint at me. Like, hey, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm fine with talking about yeah. it. I so, really liked what you said here. Uh, you were talking earlier about cleaning out your cupboards with a magic eraser. Mm -hmm. And you say, uh, I'm not feeling guilty. I don't blame myself for the decisions my son made. He was a grown man. He knew he was loved. Who knew he would do anything we could to help him. We offered to pay for counseling. We told him whatever it would take, we were there for him. But at the same time, I wonder, is there someone who needs right now to hear there's always hope? There's always a chance for the light to be wiped clean. Always a chance, always a chance for a magical eraser to make everything okay. And I can guarantee you that we'll, at least one person who sees or hears your story does need to hear this. Um, absolutely. So th those are beautiful words. And uh, just you writing them, you coming up with them is going to help. Somebody who maybe they feel um, there isn't, you know. Well, that's the thing with depression. I mean, it's just, it's such a... 
it distorts your vision mm -hmm. so much. And it's such a thief because it, it steals all your hope yeah. that there will be a brighter day, that there will be a new tomorrow. And yeah. it's true. And that's why we need to bring more awareness to depression and mental illness of all kinds, because um, to, there are still too many people who uh, think it's uh, not real. You know, just stop feeling sorry for yourself. Or, <laughs> you know, the, the infamous, or just think happy thoughts. And it's like... That's not what depression is. No, not at all. For me, when I think of defining depression, it is being a state in a state with no hope. Mm -hmm. You just, you have no hope left that will ever be first died saying to my husband I know one thing I can say is I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I did everything I could mm -hmm. the more time that goes by I have to keep reminding myself that because the more time that goes by the more I forget what it was like what it was like having him living downstairs and knowing that he hadn't been out of his place in a week yeah. knowing that he was watching TV all night sleeping on the couch with piles of bottles around him. Um, I forget driving him to counseling and having him screaming at me that he didn't want to go and me telling him, if you're going to stay in my house, you're going to go. And, and so basically dragging him, kicking and screaming and watching the door to make sure he went in and, and lending him a vehicle because he didn't have a vehicle and, but he had a job and if he could just get there and so letting him use the vehicle and then him getting drunk and taking it out when he wasn't supposed to like this I you forget what it was like mm -hmm. and so I still have to remind myself once in a while that I did everything I could yeah because the further the distance gets the more your memory starts to change and my memory's changing already like when he first died all I could think of was that darkness yeah all I could think of was how sad he was how dark he was near the end how there was just this cloak of blackness over him and then as time goes by I'm starting to remember more about his childhood it's starting to become more top of mind to smile I can hear his laugh in my head I really wish I had a recording of it, but I can hear his laugh in my head. And I'm really afraid of losing that. Because I can't record it. Yeah. <laughs> but as time goes on, I uh, some of those dark memories are starting to back off. And that and that's a really good thing. It's harder in some ways, but it's good. Are you angry with him? I have never been angry with him. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I know you're supposed to go through a phase of angry, but no, I know how hard he tried. I know. When he went into rehab, I took him there and he was, had been up all night because he was so scared and he was shaking and he had the courage to go ahead and go and, um, you know, he went to counseling and he tried, he was on medication and he tried, he really fought hard and he must have been in such incredible pain that night. been mad. God and I have had a lot of talks about it. I've been pretty mad at him. But not at him. I can relate to that. I can really go on. We have lots of conversations about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's important because uh, I, well, I'm a believer in heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, God, you know, he has that by his side and in my belief and uh, I do believe that those that uh, we lose um, fully can look down on us and, and I think they send us signs and and they send their love. All we also believe in heaven and hell.
hell that I believe is in heaven because because uh, God says he is. So. Well, that's where it belongs. Yeah. 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 There's so. no, as you said, there's no um, crime in having a mental illness. Oh, no. And, you know, I, I had a conversation with my aunt one night, and it was it was so freeing for me because she's a very strong evangelical kind of what you might call fundamentalist Christian and I was concerned about having the conversation with her because I was really struggling with it and uh, because my son was not a believer and I said I'm mad at God because I prayed I prayed so hard for my son to see the light and to get to recover from this and whatnot and he never became a believer and then he died and da 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 she said, Carla, do you believe that God would punish a man in a wheelchair for not walking? I'm like, no, why? She said, Adam was in no emotional or mental state to accept God's love because he couldn't feel it from his own family. That was his mental illness. And she said, if you prayed that he would find his salvation, she said, then I believe he did. Mm -hmm. Because God says he doesn't wish that anyone should perish. And he said, and he also says that if you ask for it in his name, and it's according to his will, it will happen. So she said, it's a done deal. And I'm like, <laughs> no, yeah. it, it was incredibly freeing for me. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know what she says. That got way deep real quick, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, that's beautiful, what she says, and I never thought of it that way. Yeah, uh, I had been, I had went away for the weekend to Victoria. I had a conference for work, and my husband was home. And I came back on the Sunday, the nineteenth, and we had had a falling out before I left about uh, Adam and I about our vehicle, and because he had been using it for work, but then he lost his job, and so I said, well, it was for work only. Oh, but I need it for this. I said, well, then you're going to... Because I was at the point where I was just like, I've done everything I can. Yeah. And um, so I think we went up for a movie and dinner or dinner and movie. I don't know. It's around 6.30. We got back here. And um, I said to Don, I said, I need to go talk to him about this car. So would you come with me? I said, I'm feeling really kind of nervous because this is it wasn't pleasant the last time I talked to him. Yeah. And so... We go down, and it's just down the stairs once, and then you turn and go down again. So it's like the split stairs. And um, I opened up the door. No, I knocked on the door, because it's a suite down there. And I knocked on the door, and he didn't answer. And then I called his name, didn't answer. So I opened up the door, and the door opens this way. And at that moment, I thought, well, that's kind of weird because there was light coming. So the doors open this way, and then if you go around the door, right there, there's a bedroom there. And that's his bedroom. And the light was coming down the hall, and I thought, well, that's kind of weird because usually he falls asleep on the couch and whatever. Like, he was barely even in his bedroom. Yeah. And um, everything else was turned off. And I, uh, I just turned around the door like this, and I saw him laying there. And um, I believe God protected me. I saw what I comprehended to be a pool of blood and somebody laying on their side. And I had this impression of a rifle between their legs. And I turned around screaming, running upstairs, Don following me. Don had to go back down to check and see if he was still breathing. So he saw everything and had some trauma from that. Um, I was spared that. I don't know if I saw it and I just have blacked it out or whatever. I don't know. I don't care. I don't. Yeah. It's no place I'm going. Yeah. And um, yeah, he used to have 22. We don't know where he got it. 
or anything, but yeah, he used a 22. And I believe he did it the night before. Um, by the time we found him, he um, looked on Don like, because when we called 911, they said, is he breathing? I said, I don't know. And I'm just like hysterical. And they said, we need you to go downstairs and just check and see if he's breathing or not. And I threw the phone at Don and screaming, ran out the front, like, I, I can't. Yeah. And it was just protecting, like I was, it was a survival mm -hmm. mechanism. And so Don had to go down, and he told me afterwards, he said he was cold and that stuff. Um, and part of me wants to believe that he did do it the night before because he knew I was gone, and he thought I wouldn't find him. Mm -hmm. I have no reason. I mean, his date of death is considered the Sunday, but I do believe it was the Saturday night. And I'm going to just believe that. I believe you're right. Yeah. Nobody will ever prove otherwise, and it doesn't matter to anybody else, so I'm just going to believe that. Yeah. Philip Marcy's. Yeah. It was great that you had Don. You talk a lot about him in your book and how strong he was and how he never, um, never told you to oh, just get over it, stop crying, um, and never even gave you a look. Uh, to this not. day, he, to this day, you know, I'll, I'll just start crying for some reason. I'll just have had a bad day or whatever. Um, these kinds of conversations will usually set me off for the rest of the night, and I'll go to bed tonight and have a good cry. And, and uh, But if he walks in the door and he sees me sitting here, he can tell it, and he'll go, sad day, and I'll go, yeah. And he comes over and gives me a hug, and it's, it's been the biggest gift. Yeah. I don't know how I would have done it without him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, it goes to the, that open com communication because he said to me right at the beginning, what, what's my role here? What do you want me to do? Yeah. I need you to tell me what you need. And I said, I need you to have patience. I need you to hug me when I cry and don't try and fix it because you can't. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly And he's burned that into his, yeah. his head and that's all he's done. Yeah. Um, not all, but, you know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, so it's it's been amazing. He's been amazing. Um, he didn't know a healthy Adam. Uh, we were married in 2010. Adam passed away in 15. He only knew him as that basement dweller, the, the guy who kept the curtains all closed, and and um, you know he just knew that darkness. So um, yeah. Well, um, you're selling these? Yes. Um, do you have a, uh, you do have a website, do you not? I do, I do. Um, either carlahowitt.com or imbearingwitness.com. Either one will take you and, to the same place. And you can buy them. You can buy them there. there. You can also buy them on Amazon okay. as well. So, yeah. Um, we'll be sure to include that in. Thank you. In the post, and um, yeah, is there anything else that you want to talk about? I think that's about it. I mean, there's always something. <laughs>